Hi, my name's Nathan Corfey. Uh, I'm a director of English in the Northern Education Trust. Uh, and we're moving on from last session, which was on structure and looking uh, at particularly how a writer structured text and how we can teach students um, to not only identify structure, not only to identify that, but also to enjoy that. Um, we're gonna move on in this session um, to speak the speech, uh, working with voices and perspectives. And I'll just run through very briefly the three main topics that we're gonna focus on in this session today. Okay, so this session is intended to equip students to explore varying nuances in voice and perspective. And what we mean by that is that students, and we'll go into more detail on this in a, in a moment, um, tend to see perspectives and viewpoints of writers as being very binary, uh, as being positive or negative. And actually there are many different perspectives and we want to explore those uh, and we want to be able to pull those out of students as well. Uh, and we're going to answer questions like, uh, what are the different voices a writer can have um, as in different ways they can write but also different perspectives they can have and um, how do we identify those number two how do we teach students to identify those perspectives themselves and number three how effectively or how can we effectively compare voice and perspective from different texts because that is ultimately what we're aiming for particularly with non-fiction is to be able not just to look at an individual writer, but to evaluate that writer in comparison with another. So those are our kind of main objectives for this session today. Okay, so let's start off by uh, defining what we mean by perspectives, uh, because obviously when we think of that word, there's a whole host of, of baggage that comes with that word, and we need to unpack that for students. And that's what I'd really um, encourage you to do with your students first. Before you go on to the how, uh, we need to look at the what. So what does the word actually mean for students? Once we begin to unpack and dissect that word, it really does empower students to know how to actually access this skill that we're teaching them. So the term perspective is an umbrella term, meaning that there's so many different words which mean ultimately the same thing. So many synonyms to this word that I've listed here on the screen. It's thoughts, it's feelings, it's ideas, it's attitudes, viewpoints, beliefs, opinions, views, outlooks, judgments. And I would encourage you again to explore each of these with students to help them understand that the word isn't a scary word, that by perspective, we just mean the different thoughts, views and opinions um, of writers. Um, and by starting at that place, it uh, demystifies the word. Um, it stops it from being a, a word to fear and actually a word to dive into for students. And you would probably then want to move on from that with, with your students to identifying their own perspectives, maybe on a, a current topic, maybe on a, a debatable issue, uh, which you can then start to unpick with your students the different perspectives they have, and then ultimately how we all have varying perspectives on various topics and how our perspectives can, can change over time uh, as well. And that would be a great place to start with debate on this one. Okay, so what are these different voices or perspectives that a writer can have. Um, now, most students, as we said uh, in the introduction, uh, stay within the safety of vague and generalized viewpoints. And that's in their own personal lives as well. When you talk to students, they tend to, again, talk very binary. It's good or it's bad. Um, if they're a bit higher level, it's positive, it's negative. Um, and that's really stifling for students because that is ultimately their own language. That's how they speak to each other. It's how they might speak at home and it's often how they speak in the classroom and because of this um, this is why we want to try and develop students emotional intelligence a lot of students struggle with emotional intelligence because they don't have the words and because they don't have the words they don't understand that you know you're not just either angry or calm but there is a, a kind of a, a sliding scale for that that you can be agitated you can be um, infuriated you can become irate and by giving students the words, we're actually empowering them, not just in lessons, but in life. We're teaching them the emotional nuances uh, that they go through so that they're able to understand their own emotion more and also deal with their own emotion more. 
So as I said, students often have just a handful of words to describe their own emotions and the emotions of those around them. Uh, Tiffany Watt Smith, uh, she's got a great TED talk on YouTube. If you want to watch that later, I recommend it. And she lists in her book um, 154 mixed universal human feelings. So, and, and that's one person's opinion, uh, but 154 different emotions uh, that we could be exploring together. Obviously, we're not gonna go through 154 with the students, but you might go with 10 or 12. You might start to help them understand this idea. And I've put this at the bottom of the screen because I think this is really important. It's our job as English teachers to open up students to the nuances of emotion by developing their vocabulary. We're not just giving them bigger words to use in writing. We're actually empowering them to be able to explore their own emotion and be able to express themselves clearer, both in their writing and in their speech, so that students are more empowered in the real world as well as in the classroom. That's what the classroom is all about. It's preparing them for life outside the classroom. Okay, so here's an example of how we could develop emotional intelligence through our teaching of language. Uh, I've got here an emotionabulary. Um, you don't have to call it that if you don't want to be cheesy. But the idea is that we're giving students the words to put to their emotions and hopefully it helps them see um, that, for example, we've got words like infuriated. We've got words like uh, affectionate, concerned, apathetic is a powerful one. Often I start with students with the, the two concepts of apathy and empathy, because they fit into so much of what a writer might write, what a person might think. So if we can teach them apathy and the fact that people are uncaring or not, not interested versus empathy, where people are invested and feel what other people feel, that's a really good starting point for students. Uh, and then of course, like I said, you could look at the, the range of emotions in, in sadness. So from kind of, you know moving from depressed and despondent to distraught and again teach them that sliding scale one great thing you can do is give the students the words on sheets of paper uh, you can then have them arrange themselves in class value lines uh, and see if they can work out together um, as a group what where they think that sliding scale is and that's really useful you could even give them scenarios you know and and, and put a scenario on the screen and say right Stand up if you think your word best depicts how this person's feeling. Uh, again, it's not just woo woo wishy washy stuff. This is this is the real nitty gritty of helping them understand um, writers' perspectives by giving them a range of perspectives that they could be uh, using and exploring, and giving them that vocabulary to be able to do that as well. Okay, so how do we identify these different voices when we have a text in front of us? Uh, once we've done all that kind of big picture work, looking at if everything from 100,000 feet, we then want to really dive into the text that we're given. Uh, and often non-fiction text is where we would find these perspectives, voices, attitudes, thoughts and feelings. And there are three main uh, places that I would be looking as a teacher. The first is to consider the text as a whole. So have the students read it or you read it together as a class and then consider what, what's the overall viewpoint this writer has. Yes, he or she goes into different ideas, but overall, if we were to sum it up in say six words, what would we say? Then go into paragraph level. So when you consider it at paragraph by paragraph, hopefully students will be able to understand that opinions writers uh, sorry, writers' opinions develop over time. They change through the text. Uh, often what a writer puts in paragraph one is not the same opinion that a writer puts in paragraph seven, that often the, uh, the attitude kind of grows in its intensity as the text develops or changes halfway through often. AQA as an exam board will almost always in their nonfiction texts that they release, have a, a writer whose opinion does seem to, to alter or change halfway through. And that's really useful for students to understand that. And then finally, you'd look at it in word level. So this is where we really start to unpick uh, the, the actual language that's used by the writer. So why did the writer use this word to describe the situation? What associations have we got with that word? What can we infer? What imagery is used? And what does this tell us about the writer? Because often the individual words a writer uses gives us more and more clues. But the problem is a lot of teachers look at one of those three rather than all three. They either look at the whole text and say, this is the writer's viewpoint and it's very, uh, very much written in stone, 
or they look at it in word level without taking a step back and actually looking, yes, this is what the word or the sentence says, but what about the whole picture? And by doing this, we're equipping our students to be able to do it in exam situations and independently and have that resilience. So let's have a look at an example together and how we might identify different voices. So this is a, an extract from uh, Malala Yuvasi, which is her uh, speech uh, that she gives to the United Nations. It's in the, the year eight scheme on speeches. So let's have a look at this piece of text and see if we can identify some of these voices and perspectives. So she says, dear brothers and sisters, do remember one thing, Malala day is not my day. Today is the day of every woman, every boy and every girl who's raised their voice for their rights. Now, at a kind of, I know this is one sentence, but a, a kind of overview um, of this might be that our, her perspective is one of peace. And we might say that her perspective is that she wants, uh, she, she's endeavoring for peace. And that's great. But there's so much more that we should be unpacking with the students. I mean, let's look at the opening, dear brothers and sisters. Now this has connotations of family, and so perhaps her opinion is that people, uh, she, she views people as equal, and that she even views people with an affectionate kind of a compassionate uh, way. Uh, the fact that she says, do remember one thing is actually quite forceful, you know? And so even though she starts initially with affection, she then straight away goes into quite a forceful assertive statement. It's an imperative, do remember one thing. Malala day, is not my day. And so we could say here she's moving into humility. You know, it's not about me. Uh, today is the day of every woman, every boy, every girl. And we've got that list there, which perhaps we might say that she's getting passionate here. She's really starting to get worked up in her, um, in, in what she's saying. Um, and the fact again, that she's emphasizing and reinforcing that equality with people who've raised their voice for their rights. Again, we can see her, um, her feelings for justice here. And so just in these few sentences, we've got a range of different perspectives that we could tease out of this. And I'm sure there's much more in that. And if we looked at the text as a whole, we may even find all 154. Uh, but this is what we wanna be doing with students. We wanna model this to them. So they're then able to do that in their own work and in their own analysis of nonfiction texts. Okay, so we've already looked at this a little bit, but I want us to go a bit deeper. How do we teach students to identify these perspectives? One way is to have them articulate their own perspectives. So that could be through class debate. So you could have discussion. And if you are doing that, make sure you're including not just the two who will always speak, but those who are quieter because they're often the ones who need to learn to articulate uh, opinion and attitude and through transactional writing. And by that, we mean uh, writing a speech, writing a letter, essentially writing something nonfiction. And in that, allowing them to be able to express opinions. You might wanna choose a topic that would be close to their heart. For example, um, should school uniform be banned? Should mobile phones be allowed in schools? Is, is, is gaming causing um, the younger generation to become apathetic or whatever it might be? And by doing that, you'll begin to tease out those um, those forceful opinions uh, and be able to put them together and help them to articulate it. Once they can write it, then perhaps you may even get them to do some peer assessment, self-assessment, where they identify their own uh, perspectives or their, their shoulder partner's own perspectives in their writing. And that will then um, prepare them for doing that with nonfiction texts. As we've looked at earlier as well, model the identification of perspectives, show them how to do it. And don't just, when we, when we talk about modeling, don't just show them a, you know, a blue pizza. Here's one I made earlier. Um, that's perfect. And you'll never, ever be able to write because I spent ages doing this at home. Um, we, that's not feasible for students. They want to see you struggling. They want you to communicate your cognitive processing. So essentially talk through what you're thinking about as you're doing it. So if, for example, the Malala one that we just looked at, dear brothers and sisters, what could that mean? I mean, when I think about brothers and sisters, that makes me think of family. And so when I think about her thinking of us as family, uh, she must be quite um, comfortable with us, maybe affectionate. And by doing that, you're helping them not just look at the end result, but look at the processing as well.
Finally, have students actively read nonfiction sources. And by actively reading, we don't just mean them sitting there and looking at it, but underlining, highlighting and annotating it, both as they're reading and after they've read. And I'll show you some of the steps you could take with students to help them do this um, as they look at nonfiction texts. Okay, so just as we looked at the kind of three main ways we can look at a text, that whole level, paragraph and sentence level, here are some steps you could take with the students to help them do this in practical terms. So the first thing you could do when they have a text, is obviously they read it, but they could underline the topic sentence uh, of each paragraph. Now the topic sentence is usually the first sentence of each paragraph, and generally in nonfiction, the first sentence of a paragraph tells you what it's going to be about. So for example, in a newspaper, we all know that the first sentence of a newspaper report will give us the, the need to know details, usually the who, what, why, where, when, uh, the date it happened, what event happened, and then the rest of the text is essentially the why bit, the why did this happen, or expounding it a bit more, maybe some interviews um, and facts and statistics and things like that. But if you get them to underline um, the first sentence of each paragraph, it helps them to identify the perspective in each one. Secondly, you could have them give each paragraph a little subheading, just one, two or three words where they identify the perspective in each paragraph. So, for example, they look at the first paragraph and they might write affectionate. The second paragraph underlined the topic sentence, they might put forceful. And again, that you could give them the emotionabulary to help them to be able to do that. Then get them to write a six word summary for the extract. I say six words just because it's a random number, but it gives students a bit of a challenge. They quite like trying to fit it in exactly six words. And it also helps them to be concise. And that's what we want. We want them to generally not, not rewrite the passage, but give us the overview of what this text is about. Then finally, we go to word level. You might then get them to highlight individual phrases in the text that show different perspectives. And this is where we might look more at methods. We might then look at imagery and we might look at repetition and rhetorical questions. So long as we're doing that, not just to identify a method, but to identify an attitude. And by doing these four steps, students are able to look at the whole text, they're able to look at each paragraph, and they're able to look at specific words in order to equip them ready for writing out that response and analyzing. And if they've done this, they'll probably be more than ready to actually write this up and be looking forward to explaining their processing as well. Okay, so the final thing we wanna look at then is comparison. Once they're able to identify uh, a range of writers' attitudes, um, then they want to be looking at a second text and comparing attitudes between two writers. Now, often what we do is we have two writers writing about the same topic, but often with different perspectives or some similar. Um, so what you do first is have students actively read both sources. So what we just looked at on the previous slide, you'd have them do with the second source. Then you have students identify perspectives that are similar or different. So if they've annotated theirs and they have attitudes down in the margin, they could start correlating and start synthesizing. So they could say, well, that attitude is similar to that one, and this one's different to that one. And one great way of doing that is a planning grid. Planning grids are great because they can then start to really synthesize their ideas. You might have them working collaboratively on this, and, and that's quite useful. Have partner A with source A, partner B with source B, and they can talk it through together as well. Finally, equip students with connectives of comparison to compare attitudes. So we really want to make sure that they have the language ready to do that. So words like however, whereas, alternatively, for when we want to look at differences, and then similarly and likewise, and words like that to show that we've got um, connections. And once they have these words, then they're able to write these up. Uh, and the way they could write them up potentially is with peel paragraphs, and where we're linking, that's where we're connecting. And we'll connect to the second text in that way. And, and then students have all the writing they need to do uh, this task with because they've planned it. And then they'll be successful with what they actually write. So in terms of practical ways that you can engage students with this, um, what could be like a potential starter would be with a, a whiteboard, they could do some viewpoint tracking. So you could put a quotation on the screen, give them a 30 second uh, timer, 
and then say, right, I want you to write down the writer's viewpoint and a writer's method. Um, and this helps them get used to very quickly identifying methods. We don't want them spending ages reading a piece of text and deciding what to put. We want to get them used to this. So for example, on the screen here, we've got the intensity of childbirth was like screaming fire, but at the end of the chaos, the most incredible creature lay in my arms. Now, what we'd hope is that students, um, some students in 30 seconds would put um, painful, agony, um, torture, but then you might have others who put inspiring, uh, relief, um, precious, and what you you might have one really clever student who's got both. And the idea is you give them lots of applause moments and you talk about how, uh, so who's right? And they'll say, well, everybody's right. And you say, exactly. There's so many different perspectives, even in this one sentence. And it's a good way in for students as well. Other things you can do is obviously vocabulary development. So having things like a vocabulary builder for a bell task is great, where you put words like sad on the screen and get them to come up with synonyms for sad or even antonyms. And again, this empowers them to be able to identify um, attitudes and perspectives in writer's work as well. Thank you so much for taking part in this session. Um, additional um, things you might need, they're all in, the, all in the recipe books if you get hold of one of those. Um, there's a YouTube channel for NET with some more um, resources both for staff and students. Um, and of course, um, speak to your uh, heads of departments uh, and your subject directors uh, and we'll be more than happy to provide you with anything else you need, including practical resources uh, to help you not just with this topic, but with any of the topics that you need uh, with your teaching of English. Thanks again.